Welcome to Champions of Data and AI, brought to you by Databricks. In each episode, we salute champions of data and AI, the change agents who are shaking up the status quo. These mavericks are rethinking how data and AI can enhance the human experience. We'll dive into their challenges and celebrate their successes, all while getting to know these leaders a little more personally. Welcome to the Champions of Data and AI. I'm your host, Chris D'Agostino. A never-ending fixation on enhancing customer experiences is true for most industries, but even more prevalent in retail, where consumer preferences for style and fit are critically important to get right. In this episode, I'm joined by Vimal Kohli, VP of Data Science and Analytics at Gap. Vimal and I talk about how AI is used across four different retail brands and the impact of a hub and spoke model when tackling common use cases for the various lines of business. Plus, we touch on the need to innovate quickly in order to stay competitive and how that innovation is balanced against the needs for operational excellence. Let's get started. All right, Vimal, thanks for joining me today on Champions of Data and AI. Good morning, thank you for having me, Chris. Let's talk about Gap, and more importantly, let's talk about the challenge that you face as the VP of Data Science and Analytics, because it's not just Gap, it is multiple brands within kind of the Gap umbrella. Right. So Banana Republic, Old Navy, Athleta, can you tell us and the audience kind of what have been the big challenges with coalescing a data strategy across four very distinct brands with yeah. likely different demographics for you? Yeah, yeah no, great question, great question. Um, Chris, you know, it, it's funny. So I've been um, with the business a little under two years. And, and as you know, uh, you know, my team supports all four of our iconic brands. What's interesting is Everywhere I've been in this industry in the last 20 years, the, one of the first questions people will ask me and we'll get into a debate will be, should you have a centralized or a decentralized model, right? And I've found both of them have their challenges. And that challenge gets even more magnified when we're in a structure here, as you correctly said, where we're supporting not one, but four brands, right? What we've tried to do is to find the best of both worlds by creating a hub and spoke model. So there's two kinds of uh, members of my team. Uh, one portion of the team is embedded in each of the brands. Those are as much a members of our uh, central team as they are members of the brands themselves. Um, you know, pre-COVID, when we were still in the office, they were co-located where their brands were, and they weren't in a central location. And, and they're part and parcel of, uh, you know, whatever, um, functions within the brand that they're working most closely with marketing, for example. On the other hand, in the hub uh, portion of the team, we have people uh, that are focused on specific domains and solving specific problems, right? So if you have someone um, who's focused on inventory optimization, for example, or yield management or pricing or forecasting, well, then that's what they're doing, right? They're honing their craft uh, to build a forecasting model uh, that can operate at, at high scale, high velocity with a large degree of automation that can be part of a best in class inventory management solution that we as a company can build and deploy to all four of our brands with customization. So, so Vimal, that's interesting. So I, I love the idea and we talked to a lot of customers about embedding the data science teams within the lines of business because they understand the business objectives more clearly, they understand the data sets that are collected, but you bring up a good point. You've got a bunch of different retailers that from, from my vantage point, and correct me if I'm wrong, seem to have a very similar business model. Yep. And so how do you optimize for common use cases that span those four yeah, businesses? Exactly do, you, right. do you centralize a team around inventory optimization and is it applicable to each brand in an equal way or do you have to tweak it? Yeah, no, that's right. So um, what we, we have tweaked it. So what we've typically done is, it is the consumer insights professionals and the data analytics professionals that we have embedded inside of all the brands and inside of all the functions. The data scientists who are building 
really the machine learning applications need to work very closely with the technology organization. Those are the ones uh, that are uh, not building solutions on a brand by brand by brand basis because that would be extremely duplicative and wouldn't give us scale, right? So when it comes to forecasting or pricing or each of the four brands will have their distinct pricing strategies, but the capabilities they need in any apparel retail business uh, that we own or run will be reasonably similar. So it makes sense to build that scale by building that capability once and then deploying it to all the four brands. Now, the rollout would still be brand by brand. We may build the capability once, but we will deploy it one by one. There will be customization that will look different. Um, the outputs and the reports and the monitoring of the machine learning algorithms could and sometimes will look different. So talk to me a little bit about how the consumer demographic and their use of technology changes brand by brand. Are they, is it very similar in terms of the ex shopping experience and the digital experience, or do you see a differentiation between say a gap purchaser or consumer from say a banana Republic? Yeah, so it is and it isn't. So I'll give you a specific example. So one of the things we've done is we've created a very sophisticated and proprietary segmentation of the entire US apparel customer, right? And we've done it in a couple of very unique ways. Uh, one is uh, unlike what some people will do, we've not done it just for our current customers or buyers, right? So to that extent, again, we get the best of both worlds because when you do it for the entire US at our market, obviously we have four brands that have a very distinct positioning, um, which um, kind of play a very different role in the consumer's life, right? These are very complementary brands. But the coverage is not only of all of those four brands, but also of customers that haven't yet shopped either of our four brands. That's the first thing. And the second thing we've done uniquely is a lot of times the segmentation is either based on surveys that can be very rich in the kind of information, but very limited in the extent of coverage uh, in terms of the number of customers you can score in that segmentation. Or people will do the reverse where they will build it only off of internal data, in which case the richness is lost. What we've done is we've done both, right? So the segments are created using very rich survey data without any predisposition to what the segments themselves should be. It's a combination of some of the things you were asking, demographics, psychographics, uh, behavioral attributes, just how a consumer shops apparel. Then we've layered on a predictive model that then has the ability to score everyone. Uh, into those segments. And then what's happened is working very collaboratively with each of the brands, they've gone really deep into each of the segments and then looked at what their brand stands for and what their strategic plan is. And based on that, and that's not static or set in stone, but based on that now, we've created a mechanism or a framework for each of the four brands to pick the segments that they think are their target segments and come up with strategies. Yeah, so online retail has obviously taken off over the last 10 years and it's challenged the business model of traditional brick and mortar uh, businesses. And you of course have a hybrid model where you can purchase online, but you can also purchase in person at a store. Clothing is really personal for most people and, you know, the fit, the look, you know, all the things that they care about from a visual and aesthetic standpoint. Let's talk a little bit about how that B2C kind of business model and AI and the need for people to understand what the clothing is going to look like. How have you used AI or what has Gap been doing sort of more broadly as a strategy for not only embracing people's desire to see what the clothing looks like in person, but also trying to minimize cost and, and scale the business? Yeah, oh, great question. Um, you said it right, right? When it comes to, um, when it comes to a pattern, fit is one of the most difficult things to get right um, because um, how each individual customer sees themselves fitting in a piece of clothing is very unique, right? So I think it is a combination of both of those things that you mentioned. On the one hand, I think we're fortunate we have the advantage 
that we have a model where um, across our across all of our four brands we have a very large network of, uh, of retail stores where customers can walk in and experience our products right and on, on, on the other hand, we make it easy and convenient for our customers to shop, right? Uh, whether it's shipped from store or buy online, pick up in store, or, or just have the product shipped to their homes. So over and above that, um, what we're trying to do is, again, solve this problem in a very unique way from an AI standpoint. This is, this is a problem that has not been solved well by anyone. Every, all the folks who have attempted it so far, whether they use like size charts or size uh, guides or this, that, and the other, none of them come close to replicating the real fit experience, right? Um, Gap Inc. really uh, put its money where its mouth was, and uh, you know, a few months back, we announced the acquisition of a startup named Draper that has a very, very unique technology where they actually use AI and fundamental body scanning techniques um, to provide a fit experience to a customer in a very, very unique way. Sounds great. Yeah, the last time you and I chatted, we, we talked a little bit about Draper, and then you also talked about uh, the need to operationalize AI and some of the challenges where uh, a company that's been around as long as the gap has been, and there's a lot of pressure to streamline, be very efficient, be very cost effective with, you know, especially in the retail space, given all the competition uh, that's out there. Uh, help me understand like your point of view, because we chatted a little bit about it last time about yeah. maybe too much emphasis going into operational excellence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. that deter or slow down the progress. Yeah. And then maybe layer in, do you think you could have created a Draper-like capability within the current construct of, of Gap, or is it something where you had to be acquisitive and go and acquire that sort of speed of innovation? Yeah, I'll, I'll take the second one uh, first. That's that's relatively straightforward and easy. Um, again, we need to stay focused on what the larger goal is, right? The larger goal is um, to give our customers a great shopping experience and to drive shareholder value for the company, right? So um, I personally, as the leader of analytics, I don't I don't subscribe to this uh, kind of it has to be built in my backyard kind of mindset, right? So we will do whatever's right for the business. I think there's two challenges from my standpoint that I see in AI. One is that companies struggle to scale. Um, they struggle to scale their data science and AI and ML investments. Most companies today have done a lot of interesting POCs, but then uh, they don't know where to go. I think the second thing that happens is, to your point, when you focus too much on operational excellence, you run the risk of getting disrupted because then the focus only becomes on incrementally improving the processes you have today. Whereas in many instances, uh, the business would probably be better off just uh, you know replacing the process completely and reimagining it right so <clears throat> the the simplest example i give is is automation i usually don't want to go in assuming that an existing business process is perfect and i just want to automate that i want to take a step back and question what outcomes that process is driving and i like to start with what the north star ought to be and work backwards from there I think that's a much better way to go. And that then to answer your question about innovation, that's where I think if you, for operational excellence is tremendously important, don't get me wrong, but I was being provocative by saying, I feel like a lot of companies are scared to break with the past and you have too much of focus only on operational excellence. It can lead to incrementalism. It can take you away from 10X thinking and you don't take any big swings. You don't go for the home runs. So it's interesting because you have kind of just built in scale, whether you, you know, from day one now, meaning yeah. like anything that you do, given the number of customers that you have that are loyal to your various brands, given the number of retail locations, given the number of garments that you produce, yeah. right? The range of products that you produce, it's like everywhere you look, there's scale in your business at, at, in every dimension. So anything that you're doing, automatically gets tested at scale if you roll yeah, it out, right? Yes, very much. It sounds to me like it's a bit of that balance of, hey, we can spend all this time trying to perfect it, 
um, but we're we're going to we're going to get eaten by another competitor if we do that. Yeah, yeah exactly. That scale to actually test things, right. and you know, forgive me for being so blunt, but it's not like this is life or death, right? So if if something goes wrong, you know, certainly there's business impact, but you know, maybe you ship the wrong supplies to the wrong manufacturing plant and the wrong product, you know, potentially gets made or something. I don't know, but it's, it's, you know, these aren't drugs that are saving people's lives. Exactly. To, yeah, um, no, exactly. It seems like you've got to balance how yeah. innovative you're trying to be versus how disciplined you need to be. Yeah, very much, very much. And, and I think that you said it right. The balance is, is exactly what it is. And I'll give you another simple example. I think just closer home to the work we do for your audience. I think here's the example I would use, right? So what the scale does is, it, the scale does two things. One, it gives us, as, as an analytics professional, as a data science professional, it gives us really, really interesting problems to work on, right? The fact that we have a long history <clears throat> and are still in the process of transforming ourselves also gives the opportunity <clears throat> for members of our team to work on really interesting problems that we may not yet have solved in this company. Right? That makes a big difference. So you're not coming in, for example, um, to you know tweak an algorithm and nip at the edges of it. You're building fundamental stuff, right? And then thirdly, as you said very rightly, what happens is we have processes in place. We have a lot of data science products that are already in production. Those are running at scale and already productionalized. Now, uh, that also gives us the opportunity to experiment with a lot of new stuff without disrupting the core operations. And then it allows us to follow a CICD mindset where again, I go back to my simple example of forecasting. We have a production forecast in place, right? And we're free to experiment with new forecasting algorithms every single day. And the day we come up with a forecast that beats the current one in true champion challenger mode, um, we can switch them and we can decide how much risk we want to take and what the upside and downside is and and we can roll out faster versus slower that's the advantage of having the scale because it gives us to some extent the luxury of being able to work on tomorrow's problems while still supporting today's business and let's talk about a wish list since it's the the season for for wishes and, and all of that so <laughs> if you're you know in your data and ai role you know tell me you know the importance of a data architecture and just all the things that make your role successful in an organization as important as gap uh tell me what three things you have on your wish list this season yeah thank you yeah okay it is the season of wishes you have to promise me that my three wishes will be granted no, i'm kidding they will um i think the first one to me is i want to move from data science as a service to data science as a product right so uh, so microservices architecture has been around for a long time, but oftentimes the the data science components or the ML components exist inside the microservice. And, and what I want to do is productize that. Uh, so the data science becomes a microservice onto itself uh, that then um, is uh, interacts with uh, the other technology microservices. I think the other, the second wish list I have is, um, I still feel like far too much time gets spent in prepping and provisioning the data uh, versus actually developing the model. So, so again, that's a journey we are on. I want, I want us to keep going on that journey. And my wish in the future is, my, my dream state is the first version of an ML model, uh, we should be able to, and, and the performance of that first version may be completely lousy from an acceptance standpoint, I don't care but the speed of it, like the data should already be pre-provisioned to an extent that the first version of the model can be built uh, in days, ideally at most in a week or 10 days, that's it. And then we can do CICD from there and keep improving. And I think my third wish list is around talent. And I feel like, um, you know, sometimes, um, you know, being in San Francisco, being in Silicon Valley, obviously, you know, we have access to a lot of great talent, but we're also competing with a lot of big names for talent. And I think there's a lot of things we do very uniquely. So what's on my wish list is, um, you know, all your listeners, all the talented people that we're trying to hire in my team, um, that's my wish list that I could reach out to all of them. Because if I could, I would say the following things. One is, 
we have a great culture in this company I've, I've been in this space 20 years and candidly in my role in roughly similar roles as head of data science and analytics a very large chunk of my role historically has been convincing the executive leadership of the importance of analytics work of data science work to make the transition to AI. And I have not had to do that at all here. We are blessed at Gapping to have an executive leadership team that truly believes in the power of AI. And I always say, you know, put your money where your mouth is. Well, this company did it. We acquired Draper, we acquired CB4. Um, they continue to invest in this space. So the belief is there. I think the other, the third thing I would say is, and I touched on this a little bit before, you know, sometimes you can join a large organization and become just a small cog in the wheel, and you're, you can be doing some fairly operational work, even though it's all AI and ML work. And we don't have that situation. We have really, really interesting fundamental problems uh, that still haven't been solved here. So when a new member joins our team, they get to work on really cool stuff and, and it's exciting work. All right. Well, those are three tall orders, and I promised you in advance that we were going to grant them. So let me tell you how we will satisfy that. So the first is you want data science as a product instead of a service. So we're really like as a company, we're moving towards a low code, no code approach. Uh, obviously, the platform is designed for uh, expert people with, you know, ML backgrounds and data science backgrounds, but it increasingly is also uh, very easily addressable by people with skills in the non-programming space. And so we're working on being able to create more uh, citizen data scientists, if you will. So that's one thing. The second thing you wished for was less data wrangling and the ability to, uh, you know, be able to work with data more quickly and spend more time on the the model development and less time on all the data prep. And so that's been a big focus of ours as well. So I think, you know, we can satisfy your two wishes with one platform and that's Databricks and the Lake House architecture. That's the only pitch I'll make. Um, <laughs> and then the third thing for, in terms of talent, you know, this podcast, I just won an Emmy. I don't know if you heard about that. We have 37 million listeners awesome. on a weekly basis. So you now have probably the broadest audience you're going to get. Awesome. Uh, I'm pretty sure those numbers are true. <laughs> but, uh, I'm going to run with them and just say that they're true. In closing, what kind of advice would you give to people? You've had a great career. You're doing some amazing things at Gap. What kind of advice would you give to people that are pursuing a career in this space? Yeah, I would give one piece of advice. I would say learn how to learn. I mean, again, uh, I was fortunate to get into this space um, almost 20 years ago when the field of analytics was very, very new. So I grew up with the industry. I consider myself very fortunate. And I have always felt that, um, that you know, if, if you couldn't learn on the job, uh, if I couldn't learn on the job, I would not have survived in this space because, you know, whatever you learn in school, by the time you come out of school, the technology has changed, the environment's changed, something has changed. So. Uh, I think that is the advice I would give people is learn how to learn, retain that curiosity, be a self-starter, don't be shy to ask others questions, don't be shy to ask for help, uh, read a lot, learn from your peers, learn from the people around you, and just keep learning every day. Thank you for joining this episode of Champions of Data and AI, brought to you by Databricks. Thousands of data leaders rely on Databricks to simplify data and AI so data teams can innovate faster and solve the world's toughest problems. Visit databricks.com to learn how data leaders are unlocking the true potential of all their data.